Let's get your Bibles out. As a matter of fact, it's probably, I'm not even going to go back to this scripture today because this is actually the introduction today. And you know how many introductions are. Get your Bibles out. Stand for the reading of the Word. Turn to James. James chapter 4. That was a very powerful, powerful psalm. I said turn to James and I was in the book of Philippians. That would have been cool. James chapter 4, verse 6. James chapter 4, verse 6. You got your Bible to say amen. You don't say it with me. James chapter 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. That word resisteth can even wind up being a military term, which means he doesn't just turn his back. He'll allow things to happen that you wouldn't necessarily want to be happening to you as you're trusting God. Wow. Heaven. God resists the proud, but give with grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will cleanse you, and will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned in the morning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. Stretch your hand this way. Ask God for a special touch. And Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We know, God, that we can do nothing apart from you, God. We have to have your hand in everything we do. Ask you right now, Lord, let your word go forth with power, with boldness, with firmness, Lord, and with understanding, Lord. Open our hearts, open our minds. The day is drawing near, even as we speak. We need you, more than ever, to help us make that last stand. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said? Amen. 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 This is my high five, low five, no five. Amen. Tell them it's good to be in the house of the Lord. All right, go ahead and sit down. Uh, it happened in the jungle. We're going to talk. You'll find you'll where, this, you'll where this joke is coming from in a minute. It happened in the jungle one day. A lion with a big ego went around asking the other animals who uh, the king of the jungle was. He said, Who's the king of the jungle? The lion roared at a monkey. Why, you are, Mr. Lion, said the monkey with fear in his voice. The lion went on and found a zebra. Who's the king of the jungle? He snarled. There's no doubt about it. You are, Mr. Lion, said the zebra. Seeing a turtle crossing his path, the lion bellowed out, Who's the king of the jungle? Scared out of his shell, the turtle said, You are, Mr. Lion. You are the king of the jungle. Then the lion came upon an elephant. Once again, he roared out the question, Who's the king of the jungle? The elephant used his trunk to grab the lion by his tail. He spun him around over his head several times, dug him in a mud hole, and slammed him into a large tree. Dazed and confused, the lion said, just because you didn't know the correct answer was no reason to get upset. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. God's awesome! Oh, God. Okay, look at this. I want everybody, before we leave to here today, I want you to think about this. We talked about New Year's resolutions. We talked about New Year's revolutions. But today we're going to talk about New Year's resignations. Amen? Well, come on now. now you got to, to stay with me now. Because right to start with, you may get the wrong idea. You may get the wrong impression. But as we get going, you're going to go, Oh, now I see. Amen? So, dear God, I quit. Signed. Blah, 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 blah. Amen? So, so let's, let's move on. Move on through this thing today. It's going to be an awesome time, I think. Amen? Uh, as a counselor and as a pastor, there's one thing I have noticed in 
just about every body's life to some extent. Somebody look at his mouth and say, he's talking to everybody. He's talking to everybody. And this is, to some extent, everybody has this problem. Amen? Here it goes. The problem that we all seem to have is that, well, we have an illusion of what control is. Not only do we have an illusion of what control is, how many is in control of your house right now? How many is in control of your finances? How many is in control of your spouse? How many is in control of your children? I saw one hand go up and said spouse. Okay. <laughs> And I, so I sharply saw you get knocked down by the other spouse. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Look, so the, the, the big thing you see there is there's this need for control. We all have it. Every last one of us. The older we get, the more need we seem to have for control. So there's an attack on the church today, and it sneaks in the back door. And this attack, although it sneaks in the back door, it pretends to be the voice of of reason. That's how it has such a grip on us. It comes in and we start thinking and say, you know, that makes sense. Well, you know, that makes a whole lot more sense than the way we work. Oh, yes! So what? Here it is. What? One of the biggest addictions in the church world today is that addiction to control. Again, we all have it in our homes. We have it on our jobs. We have it in our personal lives. We have it in our church lives. There's this addiction within us. And why I say it's an addiction is because watch this. Here's, why, here's where control comes from. If you didn't know it today, I hope you get a good lesson in what control is, the need for control, and where it comes from. Okay? Watch this. It is bred by fear. <laughs> the need to control. And sometimes you don't even realize it's that need to control. You just know that something's happening around you and you have fear. And because you have fear, you feel like you need to protect yourself, protect your belongings, protect your dignity, protect your reputation. But you have this fear come upon you. Remember, fear is something, is, 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 is when you're having an attack on your psyche now. And anxiety is when you have an attack on the future. So you don't know the future holds this anxiety, but right now it's fear because I'm experiencing it right now. So because of that, I choose, whether I believe it or not or whether I feel it or not, I choose some type of control to help me with my fear. It is led by pride. So first, I have to protect myself, my reputation, my goods, my wants, whatever. And then I have to promote myself. Because if I don't promote myself, I'll be left out. If I don't promote myself, I'll be the last man standing. If I don't promote myself when the music stops, I won't have a chair. And so because of this need for control, we've got to realize something. Both of these components, fear and pride, first they're dangerous. The Bible warns us all the time. Jesus, when he came upon somebody, he'd always say, fear not. When he was in the boat, fear not. When he, you know, Jesus knew that man was consumed by fear because he sees so many things he does not understand. So fear is dangerous. But not only is fear dangerous, pride is because pride tries to prop up fear and tries to put a coat on fear, tries to put a mask on fear. So sometimes when you see somebody you're thinking they're very proud, it's not even necessarily proud if you look at the sub-problem. It's not pride, it's fear. Because they're not sure what's coming, so now they're going to have to, to in order to protect yourself, they have to promote their self. So both of these are very, very dangerous. This need for control. I love this. Y'all read this out loud with me. Read with me. The only way God can show us He's in control is to put us in situations we can't control. Woo! If you want to shout, here's your chance. The only way God can show us He's in control is to put us in situations we can't control. But the problem is we don't like being in situations we can't control. It hurts. It's like getting on a ride at, the, at, at King's Dominion. You know, I, I, got a, I, I took our nephew to King's Dominion one, one, one of the church days, Philip, and we were trying to get 
yell the, 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 the rebel yell? How many ever been on the rebel yell? That thing will kill you. Wooden roller coaster. The line was from here to the fellowship hall. He said, Uncle Cricket, I found a better way. I said, you did? He said, yes, and he showed me the line over here. There weren't like five people. I said, well, you finally wised up. And so he said, come on, we'll get on the short line. And so I get on the short line in the Rebel Yell, that wooden roller coaster. They strapped us in and said, hold on tight. I did not know until it took off that that Rebel Yell ran backwards. <laughs> That's why nobody was getting on it. It's hard enough to have control when you're going forward in a roller coaster. When you're going backwards, you don't even know when to close your eyes, you don't know when to scream, you don't even know when to do anything. And your, your back's going, have you lost your ever loving mind? But again, say, 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 God in, our, in, in His infinite mercy, at times, we will in life get on the roller coasters in life and think we're getting on the short line in our own wisdom, our own understanding, our own control. And we're getting on it backwards, don't even realize it. And think, good Lord, God. What is happening? God said, I've got to let you see that you have no control in order for you to let me have control. Wow. That's awesome. So watch this, watch this. God never wanted his children to be consumed by that terrible duo of pride and fear. Remember, they play off each other. And the byproduct of pride and fear is control. So now, now you're going to get a clearer picture now where I'm talking about God, I quit. You're going to get a little further. Just keep listening because it's going to start coming in the picture now in just a minute. By the fact, I'm going to pass out a whole bunch of God, I quit to everybody so y'all can have it yourself. Amen. I don't know where I put them. I got it. You got it. Okay. I'll go Okay. If you're good, I'm glad you got us. All right. Now, so watch this. Get, watch this. First, let's talk about fear. I'm not going to, this is not an encyclopedia on fear. This is just a, anybody ever feel like that? We're going to talk about the dangers of fear for a moment. You see, fear actually brings torment. The Bible tells us, it says, there is no fear in love, but because perfect love casts out fear, because fear brings torment or involves torment, but, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So watch. First thing fear does is it brings torment. When it says that the word torment actually means to be locked up in chains, to have a, pen, a penalty against you. There's a lot of Christians walking around and you don't understand what's going on in their life. The problem is they're handcuffed. You know, when I, I do counseling now at Pitt Detention Center, I go in there with special license and I go to counseling. And they'll take me to it. Used to, I had to go to the, to the jail, to the, to the sales, to do counseling. But now they bring the, the prisoners to me and they bring all grades of kind of prisoners accused of murder, rape, whatever. And when they come in the room with me, they're either chained up this way with their legs chained and their hands chained. And they'll come in and sit down and they can't even get comfortable because they can't scratch anything. Or one, one night they had a guy in there, he was, he was handcuffed behind him. And I was trying to talk to him and I thought he was going to ask him, would you please scratch my nose for me? I'm glad he did. So I started asking the guys, can you please let these guys go when they're in here talking to me? They said, but you don't understand, these guys are a risk to your health. And I said, I'm not afraid of that. Loose them. Let them go. Let me talk to them. But you see, a lot of Christians, some of you in here right now, we can't see it, but Satan saw it and God saw it. You came in here like those prisoners that come in that office. Hands and ankles shackled together because you're living by fear. And fear has torment, has a penalty. It puts you in bondage. And so here's all these people walking around every day in bondage. Here you go. Can you do it? You can't do it. Make it. Make it by yourself. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, dear. That's awesome. I can pass them out afterwards. All right. So now, fear brings torment, which is a penalty, which means to be penalized in the penal system, which means to be locked up. Some of us want to live the life of God, running, running wonderfully in the fields of the Lord, but instead of running in the fields, we're actually walking around shackled because of fear. And once fear gets you shackled, watch this. Then fear.
fear exaggerates to you. It's the great exaggerator. Because watch this. First, it builds up the negative. Oh, you'll never win. Oh, you never had it to start with. Oh, if you were really saved, you wouldn't be having this problem. Oh, if you really knew God like you said you knew God, you wouldn't be fighting these demons. Oh, if you had a chance, you would be doing better now. But instead, look, nobody loves you. Everybody hates you. Don't just eat some worms for breakfast. I know that. So it exaggerates. It actually builds up the negative and it tears down the positive. You've had it. It'll never work. You'll never rise to the occasion. You'll never have what you need. You'll never come to the point where you won't be afraid again. And it just keeps coming and coming and coming. It builds up the negative, tears down the positive, and it just keeps attacking. Because again, the Bible said, look, fear involves torment. It involves penalty. And so there's a lot of children of the Lord today walking around in the penalty box. You got a penalty flag thrown on you. Something is happening that you don't understand. Amen? So now, now so, so, so here, here, we're talking about the dangers of fear. Let's take it a little bit deeper now. Just to make it very, 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 very simple. Fear will cause you to run when no one's chasing you. It'll cause you to hear what nobody's actually saying. It'll cause you to close your own door of opportunity. It will cause you to dread your own shadow. One day we're on the way to, one day, that reminds me, of one day we're on the way to Charlotte to see Bethany, and they were doing road construction, so they had us so mixed up. I mean, even Garmin was going. Garmin just kept going, ah, recalculate, ah, recalculate, ah, recalculate. By the time she recalculated about ten times, she had us get there two hours later. I said, I don't know what to do, because it, Garmin's even mixed up now. They've got so much going on. And so, then I said, what are you going to do? So I gave her the gas. And she said, dear, you're lost. Why don't you give it the gas? I said, yeah, I'm lost, but I'm making good time. <laughs> Some of y'all in here today, you've lost it. I'm not saying you've lost it mentally, physically, spiritually. I'm just saying you've lost it on certain things. And instead of trying to find a way out of it, you just spit up. So you're still lost, but at least you're making good time. Amen. So now, so now watch that. That's the dangers of fear. Now let's talk about the dangers of pride. I'm getting ready to close. I know y'all I know y'all want me to go ahead and close now, but we've got to go to pride. That, that, that's, that's one of the seven deadly, amen. The greatest sin of all is pride. Look at that. Wow, that's that's some powerful, powerful, power points. So watch this now. Now let's just, let's just slow this down a little bit. Take this a little slower. What does pride do in your life? But what, what does pride actually do to a Christian? Well, here's the danger of pride. Number one, pride makes us independent. Why do I say pride makes us independent? Because the Bible clearly, I do mean clearly states, it says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2, it says, Now regarding your question about food that was offered to idols, Yes, we know that we have all knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Listen, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much at all. That's the translation. First Corinthians 8. Matter of fact, I know a lot of people got all the answers. The problem is they don't know the question. So so pride causes us not to seek counsel from anybody else. Matter of fact, the problem is here it is. Listen. When I went to work at Fountain, I had never worked. I've worked in, I mean, I've been trained in boats. I've been trained in fishing. But I've never been trained in power boats. And these rascals, some of these things had a thousand horsepower on them. Some of these things were, were 50 something foot long. They would go 200 miles an hour. And so my job was to make sure these things were done right. If there was a problem, I had to get the problem corrected so it wouldn't do it happen again. And so, so I was going through and what I did was, every time I found a problem, and when the first day I, first day on the job, they laid the problems on my desk. Guess how many problems they gave me the first day? 750. And it said, your job 
is to make sure there's never 750 problems ever again here. I said, thank you very much. I went down and I started categorizing them in different categories. I categorized them in different categories, built a database, took the database, started putting them in different categories. And then I went in every department where this problem was and I asked every person, what's this? Who is your number one person on this? Sometimes it was the big boss. Sometimes it was the lead man. Sometimes it was the supervisor. Sometimes it was the man that was smallest on the total. I said, you show me who the lead man is, the best man, to give me some answers. And so I go up and I go to those guys and they go, you're asking me? You are the manager. You're the guy fixing all the problems. You should know all the answers. I said, if we knew all the answers, there would be 750 problems. And I said, you know what I discovered a long time ago when I worked at Procter & Gamble, when I worked at an engineer there, was the best way to solve a problem is not to start at the top, start at the bottom. I said, so I'm going here, I need you to talk to me. And I let these guys talk me through, and the first couple of times they were scared. They were thought they were going to lose their job, they thought all kinds of things. And once they found out, that not only did they not lose their job, but they started getting money extra back, uh, extra money back for giving me these ideas and giving me these things. And so as they started getting a name on the board and getting pins and getting money, then they come with all kinds of stuff. They were ready to go. But, but, but that first year we went from 750 problems. The next year we only had, we had less than 200. That's how many got knocked out the first year. But the reason they got knocked out, and that's not, I'm talking about pride, that's not me, so I can't say I'm proud of me, because that weren't me. I was the quarterback. I just knew who to hand the ball to. But what happened was, I swallowed my pride and said, went to the whoever they were and said, you know what, I'm having trouble with this. Matter of fact, let me just be honest with you, I have no idea how to fix this. Can you help me? And people just started flooding. We got answers. Blah, 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 blah. And things just started happening. Because I knew if I let pride get in the way, there'd be 1,400 problems the next year. You see, when pride takes over, see, watch this. Now remember, watch this. Pride is a mask. Listen carefully. Think about this next time you find yourself being very proud about certain things. Pride is a mask that covers fear. If I don't have pride, if I go ask people their counsel, I go seek counsel from somebody else, and I'm going to have to remove my mask of pride, they're going to see my mask of fear and weakness, and they're going to understand that I don't know everything. They're going to see that I don't know everything. They're going to say that in some areas, I'm right down just ignorant. I need help. So, 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 pride makes us Independent, so we don't have to pull off the mask and show our weaknesses and show our fears. Then the second thing pride does is is it's often the motivator, or it is the chief motivator for sins. The first sin to be committed on earth was due to pride. First, Satan. Why did Satan fall? What was his big sin? Pride. The very first sin. Pride. I I I, I got a version here of uh, Genesis chapter three. We can read about the first fall of sins. And it's kind of a commentary, and it's got, got, got all of this, but, but here it is. Uh, uh, serpent to the woman, is it true that God has forbidden you to eat fruit from the tree in the garden? He already twisted the word of God around. That's not what God said. She said, no, serpent. God said we are free to eat the fruit from the trees in the garden. We are granted access to every variety and all amounts of fruit, with one exception. The fruit from the tree found in the center of the garden. God has us not to eat or touch the fruit of that tree or we would die. As a matter of fact, if you look in the Hebrew, it means to begin to die. They didn't die immediately, but they, 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 their eternal life shifted. Then they were just full of eternal life. And once they, once they bit into that fruit, then mortal life took its form. And then they started going out. So, so, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, serpents, here's the serpent. Die? No, you will not die. <laughs> God is playing games with you. How many's ever heard any of that lately? How many's heard it in your own mind? God's just playing games with me. The truth is, God knows that the day you eat the fruit from that tree, you will awaken something powerful in you and become like Him, possessing knowledge of both good and of evil. You will know it. The only approach 
the tree, eyed its fruit, covenant its mouth watering, wisdom granting beauty. She plucked the fruit from the tree and ate. Then she offered the fruit to her husband, who was close by, and he ate as well. So their eyes were open to a reality previously unknown. For the first time, they sensed their vulnerability and rushed to hide their naked bodies, stitching fig leaves into crude loin cloths. Then they heard the sound of the eternal God walking in the cool, misting shadows of the garden. The man and his wife took cover among the trees and hid from the eternal God. And God says, Adam, where are you? Did God not know where Adam was at? Yeah, he did. He wanted Adam to acknowledge that his pride had led him to sin. This, this isn't in the Bible, but I just heard it somewhere. Uh, I can't even say this is true. One day Adam and Cain and Abel were walking down the road. They walked past the garden where the entrance was. And, and Cain and Abel looked over at their daddy and said, Hey, Dad, said, said, what's that place right there? And he slipped by and said, uh, that's where your mom ate us out of the house and home. <laughs> okay, let me see what I said.
David said, you were held here. On such and such a night. And I said, I was held here. They said there was a DWI involved and some fussing and all kinds of things, and you were held here. I said, uh, it says David Lynn. It said David C. Lynn. I said, from Possum Tribe. They said, from Possum Tribe. I said, I've never been here. They said, oh, yes, you have. We got the record. And I said, ma'am, can I ask you one more question? Is it David C. Lynn Sr. or David C. Lynn I said, oh, it's Junior. Aren't you Junior? I said, I'm going to get my hands on him. <laughs> As he was going to get a buddy out of the DWI, and he got talking junk to the people, and the people, I don't know if they were playing a joke, going on what was going on, because they knew some of the guys, but they held him for a while. Amen. He didn't tell me until after I found out. Amen. So look, two men went into the temple, the enclosure to pray. And then one Pharisee, one was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand ostentatiously and began to pray, <laughs> thus before and within himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of these men. I have actually heard that as a pastor. Not here, praise God. But I've heard people say, I pray, thank you, God, I'm not like them. Couldn't believe it. Thank you, God, that I'm not the scum of the earth. I thank you, God, that I'm Superman. God, I thank you that I'm not like the rest of these men, extortioners, robbers, swindlers, unrighteous in heart and life, adulterers, or even like this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes to all that I gain. But the tax collector... <coughs> Merely standing at a distance would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. He kept striking his breast saying, Oh God, be favorable, be gracious, be merciful to me. Uh, the especially wicked sinner that I am. I tell you that this man went down to his home justified, forgiven, and made upright and in the right standing before God. Rather than the other man, the religious man, for every one who exalts himself will be humble. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. So watch Glasses. All of a sudden, we think we got a phone booth, and we think that we got a cape, and we think we're uh, 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 incapable of messing up. Let me tell you something. That ain't so. Yeah, watch this. You really close it out here on this part. Somebody say, "Isn't yeah, this cool?" Pride love us, makes sense. All right. Pride makes us foolish. <clears throat> foolish in the Bible means empty-headed. Have you ever known anybody to be empty-headed? Have you ever known yourself to be empty-headed? Wives, well, now is a good time to point at your husbands because I asked you to. <laughs> Pride gives a man a full sense of wisdom. It says, Fear the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but the fools despise wisdom and discipline. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 20 says, Stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you're wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God, as the scripture says, He traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, <clears throat> but He knows that they are worthless. Now we're getting ready to, we're getting ready to close out of here. Yeah, here it comes. Get ready. Let's see this. This is so awesome. So, so awesome. Pride promotes self. Fear protects self. You put it together, that's ego. And once you get ego, there comes control. Once protecting yourself, once promoting yourself, put them together, once covering the other one, once taking care of each one of them. And what happens is, watch this though. Watch this. The two become a deadly force that demands to be in control. Causing us to take God's place. Now you get where I'm coming from, I quit. When pride takes over in our life, we put God up on the shelf. And we handle ourselves. We got this now, God. We got this. Kind of like riding a 
bicycle. You teach the child to run with the children with the bicycle. And then they holler, they got this. And so you let go. They hit a tree and come back and say, I didn't have it. Get them again. You run with it. I got it, Dad. Let go. You let go. And there it goes again. Well, some of us are doing the same thing. God's holding us, trying to train us. We got this. I got it now, God. You can let go. The older I get, the more I realize, God, please don't let go. Ever. Ever. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know anything. I was sitting down the other night doing I'm a sociology right now. I'm doing sociology of a Christian family. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this development of the Christian family. As I'm doing this, I'm doing this stuff, and I'm looking at it. And as I'm reading it, and reading the information, reading the stuff, writing the essays, and doing the projects and stuff, I began to think, you know, a couple years ago before I went and started taking this class, I would have said, you know, I got this. I've been experiencing it. I got this. And now every time I open up another book, I realize... I ain't got this. Every time I turn it, I go, you know what? I wish I hadn't known this earlier. Matter of fact, if I could live life over again, I'd make the same mistakes. I just make them earlier. Now, in a minute, I'm asking you to say this together. But before I say this together, I got an email this morning. It was an awesome email. And so I thought I'd share it with y'all. And then we're going to talk about, dear God, I quit. You want to see my email out this morning? It's pretty awesome. Good morning. This is God. I will be handling all your problems today. I will not need your help. So have a marvelous day.
want y'all to hold it up. Look at it. And together, I want y'all to say it with me. Remember, mine just says, Dear God, I quit because I got a whole list of things. I quit thinking I know everything I'm talking about. I don't. I quit thinking that I got it all together because I don't. I quit thinking that I'm God and doing His work and trying to have any control. I don't have any control. God has control. It's an illusion. I one time somebody told me and said, I own my house, lock, stock, and barrel. I paid for it. It is mine. Nobody can take it. I said, really? I said, try not paying your taxes. <laughs> Dear God, ready? Now we're going to say this together. Ready? At the same time. Dear God, I quit. Look at somebody else and tell them that. Dear God, I quit. Isn't that cool? I just helped you. If you'll do this, you will feel lighter when you get out of here today. If you'll do this, you'll feel better today when you start coming against problems. If you'll do this, you'll feel better in your personal relationships. Your marriage will get better. Because you know what we do is? Women are worse than men about this, but both of us do it. I know, you're always picking on women. No, I'm not. I'm just giving you psychological facts, okay? There, there's 100 women for every 95 men in the United States. Did you know that? There's more women than men. <laughs> yeah, we're outnumbered. I'm here talking about you. I'm outnumbered. That's crazy. The problem is, we get married and say, we'll get married and I'll change them. Right. Matter of fact, we get married and wives are worse than men, but we both do it. We put our spouse on the spinning wheel. And we try to mold them and shape them into what we consider to be the best most possible, awesome spouse. Well, you got to realize something. God has a whole different standard than we have. God can do a whole lot better job, and God would.